Hi everyone, my name is Brianna Laws. I am a senior biochemistry major here at Coastal Carolina University. And today I will be giving a presentation on the biochemistry of type one diabetes. Now some of you may have heard the terms juvenile diabetes or insulin dependent diabetes. Those are in fact the same as type one. So what type one is, is it's an autoimmune disease where the body's immune system, more specifically the body's T cells, attack the beta cells, which results in little to no insulin production. Now, this is a disease that can develop at any age. However, it's more commonly seen during childhood, which is why it's also known as juvenile diabetes. And although it's currently not curable, it is very treatable. So what's going on is in a healthy individual without type one diabetes, there are islet cells in the pancreas. And inside of those islet cells are the beta cells seen here in purple. Those beta cells release insulin, which is in yellow. That insulin is then able to bind to an insulin receptor, which signals the glute transporter protein to move to the cell membrane, which allows glucose to move into the cell and out of the bloodstream. Now in an individual with type one diabetes, the beta cells are destroyed. Whenever the beta cells are destroyed, that results in little to no insulin secretion, therefore, there is nothing able to bind to the insulin receptor. Since nothing binds to the insulin receptor, the glute transporter protein is never signaled to move to the cell membrane. Therefore, the glucose is never allowed to move inside of the cell. This results in high blood glucose levels, also known as hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia occurs whenever the blood glucose level is greater than 200 milligrams per deciliter. Now, really quick, how many people in here ate or drank something before coming to class today? All right, great. Nehemiah, really quick, are you feeling drowsy or having any difficulty seeing right now? Not too bad. All right, well, good. That's more than likely because whenever Nehemiah consumed whatever it was he ate or drank this morning, as his body began breaking that down into glucose, his body's natural insulin production system kicked in in order to help bring his blood glucose level to the ideal range between 80 and 120 milligrams per deciliter. On the other end is hypoglycemia, which occurs whenever an individual's blood glucose level is less than 60 milligrams per deciliter. Now this is something that occurs when diabetics either take too much insulin or they don't eat enough or they're being more physically active than their body is used to. Now hyperglycemia, if not treated with either insulin or another form, um, can result in diabetic coma. Also, hypoglycemia can also result in a loss of motor skills. It, some people compare it to an individual almost being intoxicated because they're not able to control themselves and they're not able to form complete sentences. Now, if you're looking at any of these symptoms and thinking, oh no, this might be me, how do I know if I'm a diabetic? There are a couple of different tests that you can have done in order to determine if you are a diabetic. The most common being a blood test. What happens is an individual would consume a glucose mixture and their blood glucose level would be tested about an hour afterwards to make sure that their natural insulin production system has kicked in to bring their blood glucose level back to that ideal range of 80 to 120. Another test that is a urine test, which tests for ketones, which I'm sure we're all very familiar with. Thank you, Dr. Evans and Dr. Wakefield. Um, and this occurs when not enough insulin is present in the bloodstream, it, which leaves a high amount of glucose in the bloodstream. This can result in something known as ketoacidosis or diabetic coma. Now, if you're someone like me who wants to be prepared for the future, my fiance is a type one diabetic, so there is a chance that our children, a greater chance that our children could be type one diabetics as well. So there, you can test for islet cell cytoplasmic antibodies. And these are antibodies present in only about 0.5 to 4% of non-diabetics. However, 90% of diabetics uh, typically have this antibody present. Um, some researchers, researchers believe that this antibody actually plays a part in destroying the T cells, which leads to type one diabetes, while others believe that this antibody is actually produced in response to the body's beta cells being destroyed. They're still not sure though. So a couple of treatment options, the most common one being insulin injections, can be given in the form of shots or by an insulin pump. Now which one you choose typically 
depends on your lifestyle. If you're someone who's more active, such as an athlete or you know a swimmer, or a gymnast, something like that, you're probably more than likely want to go with the shots. So you would take anywhere from about four to five shots a day, including your long term, which you would take once a day, and then your short term or your fast acting, which you would take prior to each meal. Um, an insulin pump works more so for people who are not being too physically active because it can stay in, they don't have to repeatedly inject shots into their body. Shots can be injected into the fatty areas of their body, such as the back of the arm, any um, fatty areas on the on the stomach, the gluteus maximus, and the thighs. Now how this insulin works is the synthetic insulin is produced by taking the insulin gene from a human. Some insulins are also produced from swine, things like that. However, they are moving more towards human insulin. Um, this gene is combined with a plasmid DNA gene from bacterium and then the recombinant DNA is in reinserted into the bacterium and the bacterium is allowed to reproduce and multiply as it normally would. Then the insulin gene is then separated and purified from the bacterium and uh, it is then able to be injected into a patient with type 1 diabetes. The injected insulin, seen there in blue, works just like the natural produced insulin. It binds to the insulin receptor on the outside of the cell, signaling that glute transporter protein to move to the cell membrane and allow the glucose to move into the body. That way it can be used for energy or it can be stored for later use. Another treatment option is an islet, ce islet cell transplantation. Um, this is when an, an islet cells are taken from a donor pancreas and injected into a recipient liver. The only issue with this is there is a great shortage of pancreas donors and also sometimes people run into the issue that their body's immune system rejects the injected islet cells. Some future treatment options that researchers are looking at currently are the oral delivery of insulin, which would use nanocarriers such as micelles, which I'm sure some of you remember that from lecture. Um, the only issue with this that researchers are running into is that the body's low pH level, how acidic it is, is breaking down the nanocarriers and destroying them before the insulin is able to reach where it needs to go. Another uh, treatment option that some people or researchers are looking at as a possible treatment or possible cure is stem cell therapy, uh, more specifically mesenchymal stem cells, because they are easy to isolate and manipulate genetically. Now, by doing this, the MSCs would be able to transdifferentiate into either islet cells or beta cells, which would help regenerate insulin producing cells in the body. Another treatment option is BCG treatment. The Bacillus calmet gurin is a strain of mycobacterium, but don't worry, it is not the same strain as the one that causes tuberculosis, and it induces something referred to as the cytokine tumor necrosis factor, or TNF. This TNF destroys insulin autoreactive T cells and leaves the healthy T cells. Therefore, it's destroying what's destroying the beta cells, giving the pancreas an permitting the pancreas to regenerate so it's able to produce more islet cells which would contain more healthy beta cells which would then be able to secrete the insulin. So researchers are looking at this as not only a treatment but a possible cure as well. Um, research has already been done on multiple vaccinations of BCG at low levels and those have been found to be very effective and not harmful to the participants. So right now what they're doing because these vaccinations they typically wear off after about a year. So whenever the participants were tested a year after vaccinations, they saw that their beta cells were down and they weren't producing as much insulin as they were before. Um, so right now researchers are currently looking at how high of doses they can give and how frequently these injections can be given that are still safe. Now. Some of you might be thinking, how is this any different than type 2 diabetes? Well, like I said, in type 1 diabetes, no insulin is produced. Therefore, there's nothing capable of binding to the insulin receptors on the outside of the cell. So the cell never gets that signal to allow insulin or to allow glucose to move into the body. 
and type 2 insulin seen there in blue is still produced however the receptors are insulin resistant so that is why type 1 is typically referred to as insulin dependent diabetes and type 2 thank you is commonly referred to as insulin resistant diabetes now out of all of the diabetes type 1 type 2 gestational which is common in pregnant women um, type 1 diabetes only makes up 10% of diabetics, which is a very small amount as compared to those who have type 2. Type 2 is also curable because based on exercise and a healthy diet, people can actually cure type 2, which was actually seen in one of my friends whose father was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. He, diabetes, he was not eating properly, he was, had gained a lot of weight. Now he has dropped a lot of weight, he's eating a healthy diet, eating three meals a day, and he no longer has to take the pills that he needed to take to, for his type 2 diabetes. So the face that people think of type 2 diabetes is a lot different than the face of type 1 diabetes. Some of you may recognize Nick Jonas or Halle Berry or some of my sport fans might recognize Jay Cutler up there. Um, and then there's Brett Michaels. Those are all famous celebrities who have type 1 diabetes. However, my favorite local celebrity with type 1 diabetes is this man right here. That's Aaron, my fiance. I'm sure you've seen him on some billboards. Um, so <laughs> those are some people who you might recognize who have type 1 diabetes. And now at this time, I will take any questions anyone may have.